Welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidos. Um, it's uh, an honor to have you again with us. Voy a hablar en español solamente para darles la bienvenida. Um, les agradezco mucho por estar con nosotros. Es un honor tenerlos a todos. Bienvenidos, uh, amigos de Brasil. Uh, please say hello. Write your city in the chat and let us know how many kilometers of emergent bike lanes your city has. Um, we are very happy to have you with us today. We have a wonderful panel that is waiting to interact with you today. So if you are kindly and write um, your name and who is, where is the city you are coming from, that will be wonderful. This webinar is going to be run in English, but we have simultaneous translation that you can find at the bottom of your screen, the Zoom um, screen. Please try to identify that now. Vamos a tener traducción simultánea. Ustedes la pueden encontrar en la parte de abajo de su pantalla de Zoom. Gracias. Very good. We will see um, the cities that are joining. Great. We're going to give a couple of minutes and have more of our cities joining today. As I said, today's presentation is in English with simultaneous translation to Spanish and Portuguese. Please find at the bottom of your screen the translation button. It's like a little word. For the cities that are joining today, welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidos. Please download the presentation in Spanish and in Portuguese. Follow the link in the chat. It will be wonderful to uh, interact with you. So give us an indication if you have any issues with the link. Bienvenida a La Paz, Bolivia. Oh, we got Fortaleza. Ben Vinjos, amigos de Fortaleza. And of course, we got Bogota. Bienvenidos. You had a wonderful road safety week this week. So great to have you with us now. The webinar that we are going to be running today is about emergent bike lanes, bicicarriles emergentes, ciclovías emergentes. You might have seen when we sent the first invitation that we talk about emergency bike lanes, and now you look at emergent bike lanes. There is a big difference. The emergency happened at the beginning of COVID-19, and yes, there was a response of bringing this new infrastructure for people to be able to bike. But now we really think that those are no longer emergency biking. They are emerging from our cities and we really hope they are there to stay. So we want to call it emerging bike lanes and we want to follow what your cities are doing. So don't forget to, to put in the chat how many kilometers of emergent bike lanes your city has now. Very good. This is the Vision Zero Channel Challenge webinar series, Safe Emergent Bicycle Lanes. We are going to have questions and answers with a global expert panel. This is the agenda of today. 
we will have our Vice President for Communications in the World Resources Institute, Lawrence McDonald. He will kindly welcome um, all, all of us. Uh, we will have a case study from Emerging Bike Lanes in Paris, France. Alexander Santa Cruz will be doing that presentation on behalf of OECD. We will have a safe bicycle in principle recap. As you might recall, we had a webinar a couple of months ago when you asked us to start reflecting on what are these principles, what are these basic design elements that needed to be there to protect uh, cyclists. Our colleague Paula Santos from our WRI Brazil office, she is the Brazil Active Mobility Manager, will be doing the recap. We will then engage in a discussion poll for five minutes. We want to hear from you, and that will be led by Alejandro Schwefen, our Urban Mobility Associate at WRI. And finally, we will have a discussion with the audience and our experts in the final closing remarks by our colleague, Paula Santos. Lawrence. Uh, thank you, um, Claudia. I'm so um, honored to be in, invited to speak with this group. Um, as you know, Claudia, um, we do a lot of different work in WRI, but the work on road safety and in particular on cycling is very close to my heart. Um, I'm an avid cyclist myself, and uh, I'm so impressed that we have so many people from across the region and indeed around the world uh, these 24 cities that you see listed on the screen who are participating in uh, Vision Zero represent 10 uh, countries. Um, the challenges we all faced in a time of COVID are serious. The work that you are doing to advance road safety and cycling in your cities at this difficult time is really heroic work. And uh, I hope today that you will take away two things. One is one or two ideas for something that you can do right away. Maybe it's a technical piece. Maybe it's a political thing to advance your agenda, to overcome barriers, something you can use right away. But equally important, I hope you will take away from this a sense of community. Um, you're not alone. Uh, you have friends and colleagues, not only in your own city, advancing cycling, but indeed friends and colleagues across the region and around the world. And I hope that we can all take away from this experience a sense of community and connection. Next, please. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to the Vision Zero partners. WRI doesn't do this alone. We are honored to have uh, so many uh, influential uh, and uh, highly capable partners advancing this work. Next. I also want to uh, say a word about our sponsors, 3M, the PTV Group, and the Volvo Group. Um, nothing runs without funding. The sponsors support this and help to make it possible. Uh, I'd also then like to briefly introduce today's panelists. I'm gonna ask each of them to turn on their camera and say hello. Alexander Santa Cruz, who you will be hearing from uh, in his presentation on bicycle lanes in Paris. Alexandra, would you like to say hello to the uh, audience, please? Hello, hi everyone, do you hear me? We hear you indeed. What's the one thing you want people to take away today? Uh, the one takeaway is that change can happen overnight and uh, presented as, a, as an experiment. Change can happen overnight, how exciting. Next slide, please. Uh, I was going to learn how to pronounce Anders' name uh, the proper way I have forgotten. Anders Hartman, he's a road safety senior advisor in Norway. Anders, would you introduce yourself, correct my poor pronunciation, and if you have one takeaway for people today, please say that. I am, uh, my name is Anders. Uh, I work in Oslo. And I think the one takeaway is probably the, the feeling of uh, hope that you get from uh, seeing other experiences uh, of establishing bike lane networks. Thank you, Anders. Feeling of hope. Next slide. Uh, Anne Erickson, 
a traffic safety uh, engineer in Denmark. I understand you're actually from Sweden initially. Anne, would you like to say hello? Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here. Uh, I'd love to, to participate and, and hopefully you will get something to take away from this session. I surely will. Thank you, Anne. Next. Uh, Chris Brundtlett, he's a marketing and communications manager of the D Dutch Cycling Embassy. I wish my country had a cycling embassy. Chris, you want to turn on your camera and say hello and one thing you hope people will take away from this today. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I would <laughs> emphasize that uh, the Netherlands has been doing this for, for 50 or 60 years, but it uh, experienced a, a turning point in the 1970s with the OPEC oil crisis. Um, that was a catalyst for, for a lot of the changes that you see today. And uh, I think uh, a lot of people are now saying that COVID could be the, a similar tipping point for cities around the world to ultimately change their streets and make them more equitable and welcoming to people uh, outside of a car. We're hearing good things. Hope, change can happen overnight. Crisis can drive good things. Next slide, please. Giovanni Zayas. Giovanni, would you like to turn on your camera and say hello? And if there's one takeaway for people? that you want to mention? Giovanni might be having trouble finding his camera switch and his mute. There it is, sorry about that. Hello, Lawrence, hello everyone. It's great to, to be here, thank you for having me. I'm Giovanni Sayas and I'm an active mobility consultant for the World Bank. We do a lot of work in uh, Latin American cities and I am coordinating a cycling mobility platform for Latin American cities that we're about to launch in a couple of weeks time. And I think the, the thing that I would like to, to take from this session is that we all understand that we're living a, a revolution that's being uh, live streamed right before our eyes and that we can all be part of this. So, so, um, so just, we need to understand that this is a great opportunity and, and it's a very exciting uh, moment that we're living in in this time. The revolution will be live streamed. Um, and at the end, I didn't ask you for one takeaway. I'm gonna give you an opportunity if you wish. We'll go to the next slide and then I might ask Anne if she wants to share a takeaway. Oh, actually, so the next slide is the last. So Anne, did you have a big takeaway you want people to be looking for? Yeah, I really want us to focus on traffic safety. I know this is maybe I, as I'm the last one in this uh, panel of, of very optimistic and futuristic looking people, I still want to think that now we're seeing more cyclists and now we really need to focus also on keeping them safe on the street. Safety is really at the heart of this. Um, thank you so much for reminding us of that. Um, before I hand back to Claudia, I would say, please use the chat. I see people have been using it. Um, this is a multilingual uh, webinar. Uh, if you are uh, want, you can find the uh, Spanish and uh, Portuguese interpretation. You can also type your question or comment in any of those languages. Uh, and uh, we have a multilingual staff who will stand by and funnel them to the panelists. I believe at this point, it's up to me to um, hand over to Alexander. Um, next slide, I think, is Alexander's. Actually, at this moment, I think, Claudia, you're going to stop sharing your deck. And Alexander, I'll invite you to then to share yours. We have a little technical handoff here. Um, as Alexander's pulling up his slides, there we go. I'll say that I'm very um, interested to hear about the emergent bike lanes in Paris and hear from other presenters. And uh, thank you, Claudia. And thank you again to all of our participants in Latin America and around the world. Alexander, over to you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Lawrence, for the introduction. Uh, so I talk about Paris. Paris is a city of 2 million people in a, in a bigger metropolis of about 10 million. Paris is compact, it's very dense. It is perfect for walking and for public transport. These are the main ways people get to work in Paris. Uh, if I can go forward. Yes, so the COVID-19 uh, pandemic created a fear of contagion on public transport. People wanted to cycle instead of taking public transport. So city officials very quickly reacted. They developed 50 kilometers of temporary bike lanes um, to, and 
that had the benefit of complementing the existing network and connecting the pieces of the existing network. This approach is something the ITF supports and recommends in a special COVID briefing called Respacing Our Cities for Resilience. This is available on, on our website. We make eight recommendations, including that of reallocating road space. Why? Because space is one of the most precious assets in a city. And car traffic and car parking are some of the most wasteful uses of that space. I have plenty of photos to, to show you today. I'll start with bridges, uh, emerging bike lanes on bridges. Uh, bridges are very important on a cycling network. That's because a lot of traffic converges onto a limited number of bridges. Cyclists have no choice. Here you see uh, the typical equipment used in Paris for temporary bike lanes, plastic bollards, uh, prefab concrete blocks. Uh, these are very easy to install. That can be done overnight. They do not affect the drainage of the rainwater. They are easy to adjust. You can make experiments with it. On the fringes of Paris, bridges look different, like motorway ramps. Here, emergent tracks uh, have been done too. They connect pieces of what was uh, before a totally disconnected cycling network. On main avenues and boulevards, the city of Paris decided to reduce the number of traffic lanes, uh, but to keep bus lanes and to keep delivery bays. So on the left, uh, the picture on the left, you can see that the bus lane is moved, but is retained. On the picture on the right, you can see that uh, the delivery bays have been moved, but they are still here and they act as a barrier to protect the bike lane from moving traffic. Here you see a, a temporary two-way bike lane on the left. That's a street near, near where I live. Uh, on that street, both the delivery bays and the bus lanes are retained. Only the moving traffic lanes have been uh, reduced. But there are potential problems with this design. A new conflict is created with electric vehicle charging equipment uh, by the new bike lane. Same street here at uh, a point where the street is a bit more narrow. Uh, the bus lane was retained, but the delivery bays have disappeared. As a result, people doing deliveries, of course, park on the bus lane. So do taxis when they drop passengers. Uh, this is a busy commercial street. Those activities are unavoidable. So I believe this is a bad idea. I am showing a lot of photos of bike lanes today, but uh, other tools exist uh, to create a cycling network beside bike lanes. Here is, for instance, uh, a no entry sign blocking the traffic on the street, which was too narrow and too busy to carry both bicycles and motor vehicles. Now, something different, something new. Uh, this very wide square was a giant roundabout. It is now Paris's first experiment of a Dutch style roundabout. Um, you can see that yellow posts and bollards help reduce car speeds. They promote mutual visibility. They improve the angle which bikes and cars uh, approach each other. Uh, here is another Dutch style roundabout tested elsewhere in Paris. It is also two-way for bicycles. And uh, on this photo, you see a floating bus stop. And this floating bus stop design, you can see it elsewhere um, because there are lots of buses in Paris. Uh, this is uh, one on a boulevard. Uh, now, critics would say that buses may be losing out due to the new bike lanes. I don't have evidence of that, but the city developed uh, not only new bike lanes, they did also new protected bus lanes like you see here. 
Now, I absolutely must talk about the iconic Rue de Rivoli in the center of Paris, next to the Louvre Museum. Here you see a photo in the 60s, here in the 80s, roughly the same. Uh, but here is Rue de Rivoli now in 2020. Only uh, all the yellow parts are for cycling. Uh, only one lane remains. Uh, it is uh, actually dedicated to buses and it allows taxis and deliveries as well. So it's a, a, a very dramatic change on Rue de Rivoli. And of course, the removal of private cars, of mopeds and of motorcycles, uh, there are a lot of those in Paris, that required the presence of uh, enforcement teams on the ground. You may say that's a very wide street for, for cycling only. Uh, the fact is that nearly 20,000 cyclists per day are counted on this corridor. Uh, automatic counters and with a display like that, uh, they are very helpful to rationalize the public debate, uh, to know whether the bike lanes are empty or full. I'm sure you are aware of social media being full of people discussing that question. Now, not every street in Paris has a protected bike lane. Not every street needs one. Uh, speed limits are a very important way to keep cyclists safe. Paris now is nearly fully covered by 30 kilometers an hour limits, but uh, with two major limitations. One, main streets remain limited to 50, despite the very high pedestrian traffic they carry. And the second limitation is that very little enforcement ever happens. So uh, I think much work remains to be done on speeds. Um, the city benefited from a very strong advocacy groups that exist in Paris. They campaigned to create safe cycle routes, following subway lines, for instance. They developed even a street design handbook for Paris. I mentioned this because such groups are very helpful for the municipality to develop the right infrastructure at the right place the first time. Uh, help also came from the uh, French government at the national level. Uh, pandemic response infrastructure uh, can now bypass heritage conservation constraints. And these represented a huge barrier, a huge administrative barrier to action. Uh, my second point here is that the National Research Center CEREMA provided technical guidance very early in June 2020. And this was very important to give municipal teams the confidence that they are not doing something illegal with their street design experiments. And the last point is that funding was available to, to help cities implement those changes. So what will you see in Paris if you uh, visit us post-COVID in 2024 for the Olympic Games, for instance? You will see that the 50 kilometers of emergent bike lanes will be there. They will stay. They will probably not be in yellow anymore, but they will be there. And uh, on Rue de Rivoli, uh, you will not see private motor vehicles anymore. They will not return to that street. Those changes are important. They, they make cycling in Paris very much easier. And never before did I feel so lucky to live here. I hope this will inspire other cities. I will stop sharing my screen now so that Claudia can uh, continue with the show. Thank you very much, Alexander, for that wonderful presentation. Indeed, very interesting and so happy to hear that you are more than ever uh, very joyful to live in Paris. All right, we're going to continue with the presentation from my colleague, Paula Santos. Uh, she is the Active Mobility Director for our office in Brazil. And Paula, please take it away. 
Thank you very much, Claudia. Hello, everyone. Bem-vindos, bienvenidos. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Paula. And what we are going to do now is a 10-minute re recap of the content that we discussed in our first webinar, as Claudia just men mentioned. So for the ones who couldn't join us that time, we are going to be all in the same page now in terms of strategies, principles, and performance indicators for safe emergent bike lanes. During my small presentation, please remember to submit your questions for the expert in the chat. We will be talking to them in the following minutes. We can go for the next slide, please. So you are familiar with all the challenges cities face and are still facing to reshape the way people move dur during the, pandem the pandemic. Uh, many cities around the world started to implement ambitious schemes to reorganize street space to both better support increasing cycling and facilitate physical distancing. And they are doing this simply by reallocating spaces that uh, was traditionally dominated by cars in the streets for people cycling and walking. In some cases, cities are closing entire road sections to cars, as you can see, you, you could see the examples in Paris. The next one, please. We, here are some examples of cities that took the front on implementing emergent bike lanes in Latin America, but I'm sure there are others, others that are planning already and, and implementing some infrastructure. So we already have uh, some examples in Mexico City and in Curitiba, in Brazil, in Bogota, in Colombia, in Lima, in Peru, Santa Cruz in Bolivia. An European um, example is Mir in Turkey. They are all good examples of encouraged biking. But what few people are seeing is that this pandemic responsive bike lanes can build the foundation for cities' future bike ne networks. And that's why it's so important to get it right since the beginning. It's important to have a strategy. The next, please. And that's why WRI worked on uh, with several and, and of the most recognized experts in bike infrastructure in the world uh, with the strategy principles and key performance indicators for building safe bike lanes. An important thing to highlight here is that all this strategy has to respond to community, community's needs and concerns. So let's see the strategy closely now. Next, please. So these are the four key strategies. First, integrate cycle, cycle network and policy planning. Cities that already have a bicycle, bicycle network plan may consider accelerate implementation by using light materials. This will lead the short-term investment to a long gain. But if a city doesn't have a cycle network plan, the emergency lanes can be the foundation for a future plan. The next one. The second is consider the duration of the measures. That means the duration of a non-permanent bike lane can range for a from a few day for, from a free, few days to a few years. Is that is the next one, Claudia? Please, yes, this one. Thank you. And um, the clarity in this this strategy uh, about intended duration is important for both planning the maintenance of the structure and to communicate uh, the people about this structure. The third one, please. Uh, build the case for permanent changes. Uh, the temporary measures can effectively engage people about cycling infrastructure. And it provides the opportunity for cyclists to try it out for new cyclists and, and also for drivers to experience this adapted space. Uh, some evidences have shown that once people experience safe and comfortable tem comfortable temporary bike lanes, they demand for more permanent measures. And this creates a momentum for investment in good quality bike, bike infrastructure. And the last one, but not least, allow for improvement. The temporary infrastructures have the advantage of being adjustable and uh, adjusting designs to address issues 
that emerge after the implementation is totally normal and it's also expected in those processes. That's why it's so important to monitor how the use of preliminary bike lanes is going and make changes if necessary. The next one, please. So yeah, tailor the, the strategy according to your community. Um, and that's why, uh, and, and what will indicate a good performance of a, a bike network? First, if it's safe, how and and highlighted in, in the, the beginning of our webinar, what defines a safe network for cyclists is the appropriate segregation according to vehicle, vehicle speed and flow in the street. And this is key, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it in the next slide. Uh, but uh, a few more things about, um, we, we can go back, sorry. Just a, a few more things about uh, safety. The bike lane design has to offer clear visibility for all road users, make maneuver easy even for new cyclists, and minimize the chance of collisions, conflict zones, especially in, in intersections. Uh, a good network has also direct routes as much as possible. And since the motor of a bicycle in, in, is a cyclist muscles uh, and it requires human energy, we have to minimize time to disruptions by giving priority to cyclists where possible. A good network is also current. It means that it's well connected, it's continuous, links demanded origins and destinations to match with travelers' needs. To ensure coherence, it's important to implement a uniform signage and information uh, totems, portable maps. They are also uh, good options to uh, communicate uh, the, the network for the users. A good network also enables physical distancing, providing enough lane width to maintain recommended physical distance be between cyclists mainly for overtaking and in bottlenecks such as interventions, intersections. And uh, comfort, comfort and attractiveness are already covered within the first four outcomes since they are very well connected. But once temporary bike lanes are transformed into permanent, other elements of comfort and attractiveness should be planned such as the quality of pavement, for example, aesthetics of material, and the integration of, with the surrounding, surrounding environment. Now we go to the next, please. Just an additional highlight regarding the segregation here. As I mentioned before, vehicle speed is the key factor for determining the necessary level of separation between uh, road users. Painted marking and cones are recommended on roads with an operational speed between 30 and 40 kilometers per hour. On all the roads with a speed uh, of uh, 40 kilometers per hour and above, fixed separations such uh, as bollards are necessary in addition to the pavement, pavement markings. Uh, this, is, this is very important to, to remark. The next one, please. So here are the five guiding principles to pay attention when planning a safe bike lane network. Uh, the next one, please. Safe, safe speeds. So motor vehicle speed should be set to a limit that is safe for people cycling. This encourages cycling and protect people on bikes, of course. No, not only on the streets with uh, bike lanes, but throughout the, the, the urban areas. The next one, please. Yes, the network approach. This is about uh, integrating em emerging bike lanes with the existing bike lane network and make them connecting measure oranges and destinations. And we, uh, how we, as we saw in, in the case of Paris. The next one, please. Man management and enforcement. That means to manage the curbside, curbside parking, the delivery and freeloading, 
so they don't block the bike lanes. The next one. Safe design. Inside of applying the design standards for, for, for safe bike lanes, it also important that design clear, clearly communicates changes to the streetscape and which road user have priority. Of course, always prioritizing safety for cyclists and pedestrians, the, who are the, the most vulnerable users. All road users, especially car drivers and, and prey vehicles drivers that present the greatest uh, risk to, to these vulnerable users, must be able to recognize new bicycle paths. And the last one, communication. Uh, cyclists and pedestrians need to get information on the best routes for their travel and also on the dangerous places where they must pay more attention. And engagement, engaging the population is important to identify demands for routes, gain their support and address the, their concerns. And this may be challenging in the beginning, but it, this is key for the creation of a bicycle culture in the city. We can, can go to the next. Um, this is just to finish. Uh, the do's and don'ts of emerging bike lanes, uh, bike lane design, that are quick rules for designing safe bike lanes. So the do's, design appropriate lane width. We recommend a minimum of a three meters for a one-way bike lane due to the requirements for physical distancing. Placement of lanes, the bike lane should travel the same directions as, as the vehicle traffic and be adjacent to the sidewalk. For example, in a right-hand traffic, a bike lane should be placed on the right side of the road. Attention to the lane's entry and exit. The dimension of design must also provide safe space for slowing down, stopping, and dismounting. And in general, we don't recommend designing counterflow. It means lanes going in the opposite directions to vehicle traffic because they can increase the risk of crashes, mainly in intersec intersections, because drivers may forget to check for cyclists traveling in the opposite directions to the vehicle flow, and two-way lanes, because they can increase the risk, the risk for cyclists exactly because they create a counterflow. So this uh, recap is finished. The word now goes to Alejandro, who will run the pools for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, and welcome everybody again. We're very delighted to have you today. I'm going to go ahead <clears throat> and share my screen so I can share with you the poll questions that we're going to be answering through Menti. So, as you can see in the screen, um, the first question is going to be a word cloud. Um, I'm going to ask you to go into www.menti.com on your computer or your phone and use the code above. You can see above in the slide 69132848. And you're going to, it's going to prompt you to enter as many options as you want, just in a few words, describe your experience with emergent bike lanes in 2020. And all your answers are going to show up in a nice word cloud. Those answers that are repeated the most amongst you will appear larger. We just make sure this is activated. Thank you, we see one. It might take a minute to show up after you enter them. So I'm going to give you just about two more minutes and give everybody a chance to go online and enter your answers and get as many answers as we can. Thank you, we see a couple more coming in. Reading a lot about it. Safety, not enough, opportunity, peligro, danger. 
innovation, safety. I'm gonna give you a couple more minutes. Poco conectividad, meaning little connectivity. Good, better. <clears throat> Inseguranza. Risk. Nuevo paradigma, new paradigm. Opportunity appearing large. Innovation. Thank you, we got lots of answers coming in now. Keep them coming. Climate change. Just a dream for my city. Falta de apoyo político. Women also need to bike. So sustentabilidad. Exciting, work together, more safety. We got 40 answers, nice, thank you. Innovation, still appearing large opportunity. New uses for bikes. Rapidez, thank you, thank you. We got 52 answers. 55. Thank you very much. So we're going to go ahead and move over to the next question. Which I will activate now. And if you go online to the same site, it will now appear, it will now show the next question. If you exit it and are entering again, go back to the same website and enter the same code, you will have the next question appear on your screen. What are your main questions about designing emergent bike lanes? And you will have two options. You'll be allowed to enter two of the answers or of the choices in this multiple choice questionnaire. First, what are key design considerations to how can we be flexible and adaptable with the space we have? Three, how do we deal with high vehicle speeds or volumes near bike lanes? Four, what are the biggest risks for people biking on the road? Five, how do we shift emerging bike lanes to permanent infrastructure? We see lots of answers coming in already, so keep them coming. We'll give you two or three more minutes to enter your answers. We have number two and number five coming up strong. How can we be flexible and adaptable with the space we have? And how do we shift emergent bike lanes to permit infrastructure? Good questions. We'll give you one more minute. We'll try to get as many answers as possible and get a good, a well representative sample. Okay, thank you very much for your responses. We'll now move to the next and final question. It will appear on your screen momentarily, or if you exit it and enter again to the website, enter the code again, 
you will see question number three. What are your main questions about the politics of emerging bike lanes? And again, you will have the option to enter two of the questions. How do we engage the community in planning and design? Two, how do we address concerns about traffic congestions? Three, how do we measure impacts and success? Four, what if we implement something and it doesn't work? Five, how do we empower political leaders to promote emerging bike lanes? Thank you. We already see quite a few responses coming in. We'll give you one more minute. And there are a few more responses coming. All right, and we again see question number two and question number five coming in strong. How do we address concerns about traffic congestion? And how do we empower political leaders to promote emerging bike lanes? All good questions again. All right. So thank you very, very much for taking the time to respond to the survey. I will stop sharing my screen now. And back to you, I believe, Claudia. Thank you very much, Alejandro. And thank you to everyone for participating in uh, the poll. Let me um, get started now with our conversation. So um, if my panelists, please want to turn on your, um, your cameras. Great. We have Anne, Chris, Anders, Giovanni, and Alexandre. Very good. So you have seen, we have the... Um, Alejandro, would you like to share your screen quickly to see the word cloud? Is that possible? Yes, Claudia. Because I think it was really interesting what our participants were uh, telling us in this word cloud. And I just want to reflect with all of you what was the result of that, first of all. One second. Thank you, Alejandro. And thank you to everyone for being so um, patient with all the technology. I think. Um, it is a different world, but we are still managing to get together and to tackle all these challenges. Very good. So at the center, you see risk and safety. So our, our group, our audience today is really interested to see how do we protect cyclists. Um, let's bear in mind that, you know, cycle lanes and cycle infrastructure has taken a really important leap uh, because of COVID-19, which is a public health crisis. Uh, but we have a public health crisis in it itself in road safety. We have 1,350,000 people that die or in traffic crashes. And as of yesterday, it was 1,051,000 people that died uh, due to COVID-19. So, it is, I think, safe to say that road safety is still that hidden epidemic. And you can see it very clearly here at the core that the people that are participating um, have a lot of questions about risk and climate and safety. I'm very happy to see also climate change. I think it's in our minds right now, what will happen? What is the next big crisis that humanity will have to confront? and how cycling is a big piece that can really help us. We see opportunity. We are seeing that this is a beautiful opportunity to move around in a safer way, to move around in a healthier way. 
uh, to be able to get our kids to use the streets as well. Um, innovation, how we think about, about innovation. So as we go and start this conversation, uh, dear panelists, I would like for us to reflect on these topics. Uh, Alejandro, can you show us as well the results of the first and the second poll, just to recap? Very good. So we have two main areas that we want to discuss today. One is about designing and how do we want and how do we have to design emergent bicycle lanes. We ask five questions and we clearly have one that is a very, very big winner, which is this concept of flexibility. How flexible do we need to be uh, to adapt to the space that we have? And the second one is how we go from emergent to permanent, which is something that we all want to, want to see. Uh, cities are putting enormous amount of energy and effort. Imagine in the middle of COVID-19, you have people going out, putting these cycle lanes in your city. They are sacrificing a lot, they are risking. Uh, and now we have these emergent cycle lanes. We don't want to lose that uh, and we want to see them permanent. So that's the first poll. And I think we can start with this. Um, so my first question uh, will go to Anders. Anders, I know that um, in Oslo, in the city where you have worked, uh, flexibility has been the mantra. Can you tell us a little bit about the experience and how that has helped um, grow the bicycle infrastructure and the bicycle share in Oslo? Yes. Um, Oslo's, start, Oslo's uh, bicycle lane boom uh, started about five years ago uh, in 2015. And um, a key part of it has been to use the space we have uh, in in a flexible way. So I really liked the, um, uh, which question was, uh, came out the highest um, because uh, our experience is that um, we can be uh, very flexible on our narrow streets. Also has, uh, we feel at least, narrower streets than many other cities. We don't have boulevards like uh, Paris. Uh, so we have to be uh, a bit intelligent about how we how we build our uh, bike lanes and we use tricks like, like building bike lanes only on one side of the street or uh, removing like make, making one-way streets for cars to make space for for a bike lane to uh, put them in place that is really interesting anders uh, now uh, i want to talk about flexibility and speed. And uh, um, that question goes to Anne. Uh, how can we balance being flexible in uh, the speed? One of the questions was about congestion. A lot of our cities um, have that big headache. So please, Anne, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, that's a, a mix up. Let's see here. Uh, I think speed is definitely something that's really important when you want to plan for a safe city and you want to plan for safe cycling. Because as Alexandra also said about Paris, is that of course you cannot make uh, protected cycle lanes on all your streets in a city. That's totally impossible. And we don't have that in Copenhagen. I think maybe 10% have cycle infrastructure, but we have to choose wisely. We have to make some speed planning for our cities. And that's how we can use the area most intelligently, so to say, because if you, you have to, as Paula also was saying, you have to look at your street network. You have to figure out which are the big streets where it's important for, for larger traffic flows. And there you have to install some really good cycle infrastructure. And then on the other streets, you need to lower the speed. And then you also wanted to know about congestion. And that's really interesting because all of this also has to do with moving people from cars to bikes. And that is a very good way of solving congestion also. You have to 
take that into the the whole uh, account that we are actually also solving congestion in this way that we are getting more people to buy. So by helping people to be safe and to, to get where they want to go on a bike, we can also have less congestion. Thank you very much, Anne. And do we see these concerns, Giovanni, in uh, Latin America about speed and how speed should be kept at a safe level so that we can have more cyclists? Yes, definitely. This is uh, the major issue. Um, it is a, a speed management issue. But I think that the crisis has prompted us to, to rethink how we view our world in, in many different areas. And, and definitely car-centered cities is uh, one of those models that we are seeing that is definitely not working. Uh, with how we want to manage uh, our world in, in the future. And uh, Carlos Felipe Pardo yesterday was talking about the three paradigms um, in, in um, mobility. You know? The first one was car-centered uh, mobility that we all know that has uh, failed. Then the second one was a sustainable mobility paradigm that we know um, is where we need to go. And the third one is this new um, shared mobility tactical urbanism, this, this very innovative uh, models of, of mobility. And I think um, what we're seeing now with, with this terrible crisis that we're living in, in our world, I think um, what we're seeing with, with the flexibility and adaptability of, of this new paradigm, we can deal with issues that have been a, a very big uh, problem like speed. So once we know that we have um, space available uh, so that we, we can just put some, um, some materials so that we can protect uh, cyclists and, and pedestrians, I think we can understand that um, we have all the tools available to deal with, this, um, with these issues that have been here for so many decades. And we have the opportunity to take advantage of this um, of these flexible and adaptable um, solutions. Thank you very much, Giovanni. And uh, um, to Chris, you know, we have uh, a lot of people that are thinking we need to go from emergent to permanent. Um, and you work for the Dutch Cycling Embassy. And, uh, you know, I think it will be interesting for our audience to learn how the Dutch started biking and now it is really the way they move around. Uh, so how did they go from emerging at some point to permanent? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it, it, it comes down to um, that, that flexibility concept that we've been discussing in, in that when the, the oil crisis and a, a concurrent safety crisis happened in the 1970s, cities just started experimenting and uh, they were literally out there with cans of white paint, um, painting bike lanes onto the street and, and creating traffic calming uh, in, in different ways. And, and some of it worked and, and some of it didn't. And, and they took uh, those lessons that they learned uh, and created uh, these concepts, these five network, uh, cycle network concepts that we talk about, safety, attractiveness, cohesion, uh, and, and so on and so forth, and, and codified them. They, they wrote them into a, a set of design standards that had to be followed in every city across the Netherlands. Um, and as such now, uh, all these years later, um, they have a, a, a very specific set of principles that, that every city has to work from in terms of uh, creating these, these uh, convenient cycle networks from, for people to get from A to B. Thank you very much, Chris, and um, super important to have this flexibility. And I think I want to highlight the lessons learned, um, just to be open to shift gears if it is necessary. Uh, are we seeing that happening in the lifetime, Alexandre, in Paris? Have you seen already cycle lanes that are changing that, uh, you know, might become permanent already? Um, I, th I think this issue of an emergent bike lane to become permanent, uh, 
and well, I wish it would be a non-issue. It, it will be obvious that if you build something that is so badly needed as a, a safety infrastructure that helps people connect with services, with jobs in an affordable, healthy, clean manner, uh, I hope it will be just obvious that those emergent bike lanes will be permanent. Uh, did that happen in Paris? Uh, so far in Paris, it, this was not so much, there was not so much an experiment. The mayor of Paris has been for many years consistently uh, reallocating space from car traffic towards pedestrian areas or bike lanes. Uh, it's it's the, the routine policy of Paris. It's been justified uh, by concerns of air pollution, killing hundreds of people in Paris each year, concerns of climate change, threat to our species. Uh, so the city of Paris has been building new bike lanes for many years. And I think the, um, the opposition just accepted that it's the way to go. Very good. It's really exciting to, to hear that COVID-19 has this silver lining, which is after so much work, we are seeing a lot more progress faster with the, the cycle lanes. Uh, is this something I want to go back to Giovanni and, and ask you, is this something that you also sense in Latin America that we are making a lot more progress than what we have been doing in the past? Yes, I, I think um, the the work that uh, Bogota has been doing is is outstanding, and it's it's really impressive to see the the number of uh, kilometers in bike lanes that have been emerging in the past uh, months. But I think uh, going back to the to the question about how we shift uh, from emergent to, to permanent, and I I, I think uh, we need to be very aware of the importance of telling a story, and I think uh, this is one of the things I. I love the most about uh, Chris's and Melissa's work, which is uh, very focused on of, uh, of cycling mobility. And I think this is the, the thing we, we need to understand that um, public officials need to tell the story of why this kind of infrastructure is important. Um, Mexico City just uh, launched in June uh, one of the most important um, projects, which is Insurgentes, which is probably the country's largest um, street and something that no one expected to, to have. And all of a sudden, in three days time, you have the, the country's allegedly most important uh, street with a new uh, bicycle lane. And we're seeing a lot of citizen participation. We're, we're seeing a lot of uh, people defending this new infrastructure. We saw yesterday uh, a newspaper advert by a lot of uh, organizations and a lot of uh, people demanding that the, that the bicycle lane becomes a permanent uh, bicycle lane. And this helps the government to uh, keep this, uh, this infrastructure and to, and to make it from, from emergent to, to permanent. But I think it's all about how we tell the, the story. Thank you very much, Giovanni. And I absolutely agree with you. Communications um, and being in contact with the community is key to make these transitions from emergent to permanent. Now, in the work cloud, you saw that there is a lot of interest on the risk. Um, so we don't have a lot of time today, but with all the experience that you have, I want to ask um, you, Anne, Chris Anders, on um, what are those designs that you will um, avoid having in a cycle lane? Uh, what, if you can give, you know, 10 minutes of recommendations to our panel, to our audience today, to, they, they are concerned about building cycle lanes that are um, dangerous, that can put people at risk. Uh, so what will be your two, each of you, uh, main recommendations on please be careful on this type of design um, for our audience? Anne, would you like to get started? Yes, of course, but ooh, it's very difficult. 
I would like to say, uh, as always, be very careful in the intersections because we have seen in our analysis that when you look at where accidents and where the serious accidents are uh, between cyclists and, and motor vehicles, it's in the intersections. And there are simple ways to do things in, in, in regular intersections where you make the, the secondary road slow down before the, the cars enter the main road, for example, in, in non-regulated non in signals, not signalized intersections. In signalized intersections, there is also very many things you can do to improve. But intersections has a special focus for me. Then another thing I'd like to point out is, of course, in these uh, protected bike lanes, you really need to be careful with the material you use, because what we see also when we use hospital registrations for uh, for accidents is also that there are very many single bicycle accidents where though the, the the problem can actually be some of the materials that are used if you don't maintain bollards and things like that um, they might end up on the bike lane and uh, in darkness which we also have a lot of time of the year and 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 the day um, you can't see those as a cyclist. So you need to be very careful with your material use uh, so, and your, your maintenance of the cycle infrastructure as well. So I would say focus on intersections and also focus on good material and, and, um, and things that, that can't hurt the cyclist if they're on the cycle lane. Thank you very much, Anne. Andres, what are your recommendations and I know that Oslo last year uh, achieved vision zero. You didn't have any cyclist skill, any pedestrian, any child. Uh, so what are those you know key elements that you have been working on? I think the the main thought behind uh, how we build bike lanes in Oslo is is to think that um, the cyclist is uh, able to make some choices about their own safety. Uh, so I always like to think that if it feels safe to a cyclist, it probably is safe. Um, so, and if it's also, if it's tidy and easy to use, and uh, if you get all the cyclists to use it in the same way, um, that you don't have like three or four different patterns of cyclists using uh, an intersection, for instance, uh, then it's, if it's all uniform uh, when they use it, uh, it's also probably safe and quite predictable. Uh, and then I mean, we, we always, uh, when we think about installing a bike lane, we also always consider uh, speed reductions and speed enforcement. Uh, so we, we, do, uh, we do a lot of, um, like what you could call it constrictions where we narrow the street at intersections uh, or we place speed humps. Uh, we use a lot of them about, I think we've placed about 500 speed humps in the last uh, five years and also reducing the, the posted speed limit. Um, about one third of the streets in Oslo are 30 kilometers per hour. So if, it's, if it feels safe and, and it's used in a uniform way, all, all cyclists should be able to use it in the same way. Um, so you don't, for instance, if, if children have to use the sidewalk because the bike lane is not safe enough, that's probably a sign that you should have chosen a different design. Very good, thank you very much, Anders. Chris, would you like to um, add a couple of features from the Netherlands? Absolutely. Um, I will just uh, agree with Anne wholeheartedly on the importance of getting the intersection right. And um, I think it's one thing that the Netherlands does incredibly well is the physically protected intersection with uh, bulb outs at the corners and uh, uh, refuges in the middle of the intersection so that the, the cyclist isn't exposed to traffic. Uh, because too often we, we just kind of throw the cyclist into no, no man's land 
uh, because the intersection is deemed too complicated or difficult to actually solve. And, and that includes uh, crossing of side streets and driveways as well. Um, so there are uh, color treatments and, and um, material treatments that you can use to, to keep the cycle track as a, a seamless entity where the cars are, are having to enter the bike space rather than the bicycle entering the car space. And it's a very uh, important feature that, uh, that makes um, uh, the drivers aware that they are crossing an active cycleway. Um, the second principle I would I would definitely emphasize is width, and uh, I think far too often you see these narrow cycle lanes that are being built, uh, basically only wide enough for one single cyclist to ride. And uh, the the design guidelines in the Netherlands are here uh, that that recommend an absolute minimum of 1.7 meters in width, and and uh, recommend at least 2.2 meters, which allows for side by side cycling. It allows for a variation of speeds on the cycle track, especially more important as more children get on the cycle track or electric bikes, there's a variety of speeds that uh, that allows those uh, uh, different types of cyclists to mix um, and also allows mobility scooters and, and wheelchairs and, and people with other devices to, to access the cycle lanes, kick scooters, uh, uh, and you name it. So um, I think uh, I would, I would uh, definitely uh, encourage people to to not sacrifice on the width because that will ultimately uh, limit the type of people using the cycle lane and could ultimately impact safety as well. Thank you very much, Chris. And we have a question from our audience. Uh, Dante Rosado, a good friend from Fortaleza, is asking us, what about the impact on public trans transit? So uh, we have seen some of that in uh, your pictures in Paris, Alexandre. Do you want to tell us what is the impact that you are seeing right now in public transit? Yes, sure. I'd say that uh, in a city where bike lanes are, are here are protected, where there is enforcement to prevent people from parking in the bike lanes, uh, in such a city, there should be no problem. And uh, we see that some cities in the world are creating new bike lanes, uh, new, sorry, new bus lanes uh, in this uh, pandemic time, uh, because that works. And um, yeah, I think that's the solution. Uh, creating new bike lanes may temporarily create more car traffic congestion, but the solutions exist to protect buses from that. Um, there should be no problem at all. Thank you very much, Alexander. Anything else that we want to add in terms of transit and how we manage this balance with mass transportation, which is absolutely uh, important in our cities in cycling? I could just add a, a few words uh, on, on the, uh, the synergy between cycling and public transportation that exists. And, and I think Far too often the two modes are put in uh, conflict with one another when they, they could actually work uh, in combination. And so you see a lot of really great bike parking facilities here at the train and bus and tram stations here um, because it, it widens the catchment area of the, the public transport network and it feeds more customers into the system uh, and also has a benefit of putting more cyclists on the bikeways. So the, the design of the infrastructure is such that um, the, the, the cycling networks feed into the public transport system. Uh, and as we're seeing with COVID, with people perhaps more hesitant to use public transport, uh, this may be a way to help with the efficiency of those systems and, and uh, support, uh, give them the support that they need. That is really great. So let's have to attend them so we can have public transportation and cycling working together. I really like that. Uh, this conversation is really amazing. We have to shift a little bit towards uh, the political will. So I'm gonna ask again Alejandro to uh, briefly share the screen so that we can see the questions that our uh, audience selected for the discussion. No problem, Claudia. Thank you. Very good. So this is the first one about designing.
Here we go. And this one is about the politics. And we have two big ones. The first one is how do we empower political leaders to promote emerging um, cyclones? And the second one is how do we address concerns about traffic congestion? We have talked a little bit about uh, those already. We also have uh, how, mesh, how do we measure the impact and how do we engage the community? But I'm going to focus right now on these two ones. Um, so Alejandro, thank you for sharing your screen and let's get started. So we want to get our political leaders engaged. And um, I think I'm going to start this time with Giovanni. How are you seeing that the leaders in Latin America are starting to get engaged to work more on emerging um, cycle links? I think we've seen some impressive uh, leadership. Um, I think um, probably the, the most important um, leader has been uh, the Bogota mayor, Claudia Lopez. I think um, she has really taken this, this idea of emerging bicycles, uh, bicycle lanes as, as a solution to, to the, the mobility crisis um, that has been caused by uh, COVID. Um, I think it's really interesting when, when we talk um, often with uh, Latin American leaders and public officials, there's often this uh, misconception that um, European cities are completely shielded from this uh, kind of, um, of issues with, um, with uh, political issues and with certain um, sectors that don't agree with these uh, kind of uh, interventions. We've seen um, the kind of um, leadership shown by a lot of um, leaders in the UK. Uh, we've seen this counselor in Hackney, John Burke, that has even received um, uh, death threats for the low traffic uh, neighborhoods. So I think we need to understand that uh, a lot of people will not agree with this kind of um, uh, projects, with this kind of initiatives. So that's why uh, I go back to the, to the storytelling uh, aspect, uh, but also about building a, a broad coalition of, of people that agree with kind of uh, infrastructure. And I am sure that there's a majority of people that agree with this uh, kind of uh, initiatives. We all want uh, cleaner air. We all want safer streets, but we need to tie in those aspects, those ideas with the projects that we are implementing. And I think this is the kind of uh, empowerment that uh, can shield these initiatives. So I think um, we need to understand the importance of, of a broad coalition of people that are willing to defend this kind of um, these projects. And uh, we need to show our public officials, we need to show our leaders that these are initiatives that are being demanded by by our by the people, by the residents of, of the cities that they, they lead. Thank you very much, Giovanni. So true. Um, and now I'm going to ask um, our, our panelists here, which of the leaders in your country bike? Does uh, the mayor of Paris bike, Alexandra? Occasionally she does, yes. Um, every time there is the inauguration of a new bike lane, for instance, that is a, that is a good signal, I think. Absolutely. Anybody else? Do your leaders bike? And also, almost all the politicians bike because they, two years ago, they removed all the parking spaces from City Hall. That's one way to do it. <laughs> I think if you've spent any time on social media these days, you've seen photos of the Prime Minister of the Netherlands uh, cycling in the royal family. It's, uh, it's really something that everybody does here, and uh, including all of the mayors and, and city councillors. And, and there's no doubt that that bleeds into their politics and, and, and causes them to support uh, even better cycling measures. Cycling and eating, eating an apple, right, Chris? Exactly. <laughs> We have also in Denmark seen the royal family using cargo bikes when they transport their kids to to kindergarten and so on. And I think these are very good for photo ops. But also, I think it's uh, important to to just be show everyday people biking. I mean, it's really we also know that these are are also for 
not I'm, I'm not going to call it show off because it's also part of their regular life. But of course, it's important to see masses of people work going on bikes. Also, I think that's what's impressive. I was really impressed by Alexandra's picture of this the Rivoli, where you could see the change in in from being massive amount of cars and then now being cycle instructor. We have those sort of historical pictures from Copenhagen, which I also think is very interesting to to take out uh, when you want to talk to politicians. You see pictures from the 30s and 40s where everyone went on a bicycle. And then you see from the 60s and 70s, and there's so many cars. And then you can see maybe now they have changed back to bicycles. So we need to get the history as well, because many of our cities and countries have actually relied on the bicycle in earlier ages when not everyone could have a car. So history is also really important. We have a question from uh, Giovanni Salta, and he is talking about this conflict in his city where he sees politicians uh, that really don't understand why cycling is a priority. And they still see that the car is the uh, perfect image of progress. And I think that question ties uh, with the question that I asked before, if your politicians know what is to bike, if they uh, feel that the kids can bike, and if that in any way influences their support and their work in cycling. Um, so I just would like to ask you, how in your countries have shifted from this image, if it has happened, uh, from the car being progress equals progress to cycling? Chris, maybe you would like to get started. Well, I can I can say from from the Dutch perspective, it can be both. I mean, the the rate of car ownership here is is comparable to anywhere else in the world, and most families still own a car and they use a car where appropriate. But um, you know, for those short journeys in your neighborhood in your city, uh, the bicycle is is just convenient and and enjoyable and and made so and so. It's not a, a question of either or, or um, but for large parts of the population, children, the elderly who don't have a driver's license, uh, people on the lower end of the economic ladder, um, the bicycle is, is uh, a, an equalizer. It gives them access to opportunity. It gives them um, you know, freedom. And, and, and so it, it really comes down to this question of equity. Should everybody in your city uh, need to own this uh, this this very expensive and complicated piece of machinery just to to exist and and I th hope if a politician is uh, open to that argument then then they're willing to create uh, just the the basic amount of space to help those people get from A to B. Thank you very much, Chris. Anybody else would like to reflect on that? Well, I think um, I think in. Chris, in Sorry, I think in uh, Mexico we we we're seeing uh, um, the car industry is still a very dominant player in the country's economy. We're seeing that um, infrastructure to move cars is still a very important um, aspect in economic uh, development. We're seeing, even though we're seeing a lot of cities um, building new cycling infrastructure, building new bus lanes, building BRTs, we're still seeing those same cities building flyovers and, and car um, infrastructure and, and spending uh, billions of pesos in, in, those, in that kind of infrastructure. So I think there's still a lot of um, car-centric um, thinking and mentality in, in all aspects in, of our public life, not only in politicians, but I think with a, a lot of people that um, even use public transport, they, they still have this um, aspirational aspect to, to the car. And they, they, the minute that they have more disposable income, they will probably start using a car. So they probably will, will not like the, the new infrastructure to take away car um, space because when they have it they want to use that space so it is a very difficult aspect but i think uh, little by little we're seeing that um we are we're implementing a new mentality in, in latin america 
That is truly very important to mention the economic powers and how that really puts a pressure on, on our countries. I think it was last year in a conference where um, a Brazilian panelist mentioned how in order to recover from the economic crisis, the government of Brazil put a target of producing more cars, right? And that will really increase the economy. With that, cities like Fortaleza, for example, double their number of vehicles in 10 years. Uh, so absolutely, uh, Giovanni, these are forces that are really strong. All right, we are almost at the end of our uh, webinar. And with that, I want to thank you very much, Anne, Chris, Anders, Giovanni, and Alexandre. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, this conversation really can go on and on on so many aspects on cycling, uh, but I think this is a really good beginning. Now I would like to ask my colleague, uh, Paula, to help us wrap up the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you for the questions and answers. Thank you for the panelists. We had a very good discussion. I'd like to briefly highlight some ideas to, to stick in our minds. I think uh, in with Alexander's uh, presentation of Mayor Zen Hidalgo legacy, we, we found out that the, the city already has implemented 60, uh, 50 kilometers of emergent bike lanes and the importance of connecting the existing uh, network of, uh, for, with those um, emergent bike lanes. I think there is something that we talked a lot in, in this webinar. Uh, he showed a very good example of design and protected bus lanes also that integrated uh, with this new network of bike lanes. Uh, the dramatic change at the Rue de Duhibali and that is an iconic uh, street that uh, is also good for us to see that it's, it's not a, it's, it, bike lanes is not a matter of a small street, but it, it's also a matter of big avenues and iconic streets in our cities. The speed reduction, I think it's a, a thing that uh, we mentioned a lot the, the importance of the integration of these new bike lanes with uh, a speed management plan. And Anne also um, mentioned that not all the network is, uh, compri comprises uh, exclusive bike lanes. So the entire city has to slow down uh, to, to make it safe for bicyclists. Um, well, in my, my presentation, I brought some strategy principles and performance indicators, just remembering that we uh, share with you a link uh, of this presentation in Portuguese and Spanish, so you can check it all uh, later. We also talked a little bit about the flexibility that is key in Oslo to make bike lanes uh, possible because the city uh, doesn't have those huge boulevards, so uh, flexibility, in, especially in these times, is key. Um, what more? We discussed it a little about how to shift from, from emergent to permanent. Giovanni brought that uh, it's important to tell the history, the communication with uh, the, the people. It's, it's important to make the case. And regarding the design, with something that we, we should highlight is be careful in the intersections. It, this is where uh, the most part of the accidents happen. Uh, be careful with materials and the maintenance, uh, make predictable design and speed reduction as Oslo did. Um, mind the width of uh, the bike lanes because uh, children may, may use it and other modes of transportation like the electric bikes and, and scooters. So don't be, don't, don't sacri sacrifice as, as Chris just highlighted. And regarding the political engage, we talked about um, that all countries struggle with people who, who don't agree with bike lanes. So it's not a, a 
a matter of Latin American countries that, that has this issue. Um, so build a coalition with people who do agree to make the case and they will help to, to implement the bike lanes. Um, cars means progress in our country. So uh, this is an issue, but uh, little by little, we are changing our minds. I think um, uh, Giovanni highlighted this and at least our children and our young uh, people are not uh, willing to have a car anymore. I think this is something that can change our world in, in the next years. And I think this is our uh, main highlights. Uh, do we have the slides with the next uh, webinars? I think this is in the, the next one. Thank you very much, Paula. Yeah, um, our next webinar is on October 22nd at 10 a.m. Uh, again, it's time. Uh, and this time we are going to talk about children and we will really love to have you in that conversation. Very important, absolutely fair to protect our kids and to give them a space for walking, for cycling, for just going around their life. Um, with that, I think I want to thank you um, in the audience for participating, uh, for caring about road safety, for caring about cycling. A special thanks again to our panelists and to my dear colleagues that have worked very hard to put together this uh, webinar. Thank you, Anne Bray and uh, uh, Wes On and all, all the WRI colleagues. Uh, thank you very much. And until next time, stay safe.